mentions only. It says, there shall be a Supreme Court of the United States composed of nine members. And then it has a couple of other little sentences and it says, Congress shall have the power to create whatever other courts Congress might decide we need. And every other court, every district court, and every circuit court of appeal was created by Congress. Congress passed laws saying in the state of Kansas, we're going to create a new United States district court that shall be headquartered in Topeka, the blah, 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 blah. Okay? So the only court, again, mentioned by the Constitution is the Supreme Court. And it says that it shall have nine members. It says that they shall be appointed by the president and that they shall be appointed for life. The only way to get rid of a Supreme Court justice is to impeach the justice. And it's, it's pretty much the same standards as impeaching the president. You gotta prove that the dude did something really, really bad to get him thrown off the bench. So the other thing that has happened with the Supreme Court is it's the top court in the country, but the Supreme Court does not have to hear, it is not required to hear any case. They don't, with very limited exceptions, cases that involve in matters of international law, Supreme Court, only the Supreme Court can hear a few. Not, don't write that down because it's not even all that accurate, but there's a handful of cases that only the Supreme, that when they start, they go straight to the U.S. Supreme Court. But all other things aside, in terms of this whole appeal process, Supreme Court is not required to hear any case brought to it. If you want the Supreme Court to hear your case, to review it, this is what you file. A petition, it's like a lawsuit, for a writ of certiorari, a mouthful. A writ is an old English legal term for an order, just an order issued by a court. Certiorari means send a record up. Now, what are we talking about here? Well, what I did say to you was, again, all trials, all lawsuits, all cases originate in the district courts, right? These guys don't hold trials. There are no trials in the appellate courts. Trials with witnesses and evidence and all take place only in these lower courts. So when a case goes to a higher court, to a state circuit court or a U.S. circuit court or a Supreme Court, all that the judges on the appeals court have in front of them is what we call the hard, cold record. That is, they have to decide whether or not the lower court, judge or jury, got the case right or wrong, but they have to make that decision simply based on what they're reading off pieces of paper. So you know that in a court, whenever there's any proceeding going on, there's a court reporter present, right? The person, a man or a woman, sitting up at the front so they can hear everything that everybody says, and they're typing away on that clunky little rectangular machine that doesn't type in English or letters, it's symbols. And they're taking down literally everything that every person in that courtroom involved in the case says. So if a case goes up on appeal because the losing party wants to appeal it, the losing party has to arrange with the court reporter who took all that stuff down to pay that court reporter to now take that gibberish that she typed and turn it into English and produce a written transcript of every word uttered by anybody, by the judge, by a member of the jury, by a witness, by a lawyer, anything anybody has said in that courtroom during that trial is going to be typed out in English in a transcript. So the transcript of everything that was said, along with the pleadings, pleadings are all the paper that the lawyers filed in the case. So the lawsuit, um, did I, I don't know if I told you guys this, in 
state court, a lawsuit is called a petition. In federal court, they refer to the lawsuit itself as a complaint. Defendants in state and federal court have to file an answer to a petition or a complaint. And then the parties file various motions throughout the course of the case. So when a case goes up on appeal, whether it's to the U.S. Supreme Court, Louisiana Supreme Court, or the Circuit Court of Appeal, all the judges on these appellate courts have in front of them is the written transcript where they can read everything that was said and all the paper that was filed in the lower court by both sides. So one reason, one very important reason, that 85 to 90 percent of all cases that go up on appeal, the appeal court affirms or upholds what the lower court did, is the appellate courts noticed and noted right away that, you know, it's not the same. We're not getting the same sense of the proceedings when you're just reading them off a paper. As you do, if you're sitting there in the courtroom, hearing with your own ears, seeing with your own eyes the witnesses and the evidence. So, for example, a lot of times cases come down to whose witnesses are more believable, right? Kind of an interesting thing to ponder because you sit there and think, you know, we're all taught, man, don't lie under oath, right? That's perjury. You can go to jail for that. But if you sit in courtrooms and listen to trials, you know that probably half the people I take to stay in a line because they're saying something diametrically opposed to what the other guy said. So somebody's lying, right? Or at least somebody has a faulty memory, if you want to put it a nice way. So the idea is the judge who's presiding over the trial and the members of the jury who are sitting there, they are in the best position to decide which of the witnesses for both sides of the case appears to be more believable. Somebody's lying, right? The sex harassment case. Supervisor says, I never said or did anything to that woman. She says, the hell you didn't. You did this, you said that, you did this. He says, I did none of that. Well, one of them's lying, clearly, right? So the idea is that the appellate courts say, if the judge and the jury chose to believe one side's witnesses over the other side's witnesses, we as an appellate court, we are not going to touch that. We cannot change that. Even though we're sitting here as the appellate court and we're reading all of this off the paper, and from reading it off the paper, if I had been the judge at the trial, I would have believed the other side's witnesses, not the ones the judge believed. But the appellate courts say, even if that is the case, we as appellate court judges cannot substitute our opinion for the opinion of the judge and the jury who sat there eyeballing the witnesses, hearing what they had to say. If they decided that the plaintiff in the sex harassment case was more believable than the supervisor she accused of harassment, we're not going to change that because, again, the jury and the judge are sitting there, so they're looking at these people. So if one witness appears to be particularly nervous, right, not making eye contact with the jury, not looking at the lawyer, keeping her head down, mumbling, sweating profusely, wringing hands, a jury is going to look at that and go, well, that guy sure is kind of nervous about testifying here, you know? And then the other side's witness gets on and she's, you know, in control and very sincere, and the jury goes, man, she's the one telling the truth, and that dude has to be lying. He is so freaking nervous. You would think that, like, you know, a lie detector was hanging above his head and that the jury was going to figure it out immediately. He's so nervous. So the appellate courts say, we can't get that sense of who's more believable, who's more credible off the paper. It's not the same to read what they said as it is to be sitting there hearing what they say live right there with their expressions and their demeanor and the way they hold their bodies and all of that. So because the appellate courts will not second-guess 
the judge or the jury's decisions about whose witnesses are more believable, that is a major reason that appellate courts almost, in 85% of the cases, affirm the decision of the lower court. They are not going to second guess the people who are sitting there, heard it with their own ears, saw it with their own eyes. So, with respect to the Supreme Court and this petition for writ of cert, again, the Supreme Court does not have to hear any case it doesn't want to hear. 95% of all petitions for writ of cert, this is the short way of saying this, that go to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court issues a one-word decision, denied. That means we ain't hearing your case. Which means, of course, we're here. The decision of the Circuit Court of Appeal is the final word, right? If the Circuit Court of Appeal issues a decision and the loser wants to go to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court says, we're not going to hear your case, which is what they say 95% of the time. That means the decision of the Circuit Court of Appeal stands. This is the final ruling. This is the final word, and there ain't nowhere to go from there. Once the Supreme Court says, we don't even want to hear your case, nowhere to go. If they want to hear your case, they will say, writ of certiorari granted. What that technically means is it's an order to the Circuit Court of Appeal, the court right below them, to send the whole record, the transcript of the trial, all the documents, send that up to the Supreme Court. We're going to hear the case. We're going to review the case. So the way we say it is that the appellate courts have to judge what happened in the lower courts based on the so-called cold, hard record. Again, reading it off of paper is not the same as being there and seeing it for yourself. So they rarely, if ever, second-guess the lower courts. The U.S. Supreme Court is most likely to agree to hear cases that fall into one of two categories. If, in fact, the case involves a question arising under the United States Constitution, and four of the nine justices say, we believe this case involves an important principle under the U.S. Constitution, then the Supreme Court will agree to hear the case. So notice what I said, four of the nine. It doesn't take a majority if the reason the court is going to hear the case is because it involves important questions under the United States Constitution. They will agree to hear it. That doesn't mean the person bringing the appeal wins. It just means, okay, we'll listen to it. That's all it means. You may well still lose, but we'll at least let you file your pleadings, file your briefs, come up here and argue the case, et cetera, et cetera. The other kind of situation, and this is the more frequent of the two, where the Supreme Court is likely to agree to hear the case is where you have a conflict among decisions rendered by the various circuit courts of appeal. So what I haven't told you is there are, for our purposes, 11 circuit courts of appeal in this country. So let me back up for a minute. Every state in the country has at least one United States district court. The states that have larger populations have more than one United States district court. Louisiana, we have three U.S. district courts. They're divided up geographically. The Eastern District of Louisiana, that's a federal court located at Camp and Fortress in New Orleans. The Middle District of Louisiana is headquartered in Baton Rouge, and the rest of the state falls in what's called the Western District of Louisiana. Baton Rouge and New Orleans are obviously the most populated of the cities in this state, so Western District encompasses even cities that really aren't even in the West. Monroe, which is in the northeast corner of the state, Shreveport, which is northwest, Alexandria, Central West, Lake Charles, Lafayette, they all form part of the Western District. I'm not going to ask you those questions. Just be aware that we have three federal district courts in the state of Louisiana. 
In small states like Delaware, they got one district court. In states like California, I have no idea. They probably have 30, okay, in large states. Then when you move to the circuit courts of appeal, there are 11 of them total in the country. So that means each circuit court of appeal has authority over multiple states, over the district courts in a number of states. Anybody know what circuit court of appeal Louisiana falls into? Fifth. Fifth, Fifth. yes. The most conservative circuit court of appeal in the United States, and it's been that way for a long time. There are two other states that are covered by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal in addition to Louisiana. Anybody know? It's our two immediate neighbors. Texas to the west, Mississippi to the east. Okay, it used to be um, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, maybe Georgia. But anyway, as, as populations grew, Alabama was carved out and became part of the new 11th Circuit. The 11th Circuit is the most recently created Circuit Court of Appeal. So, sometimes, when you've got 11 Circuit Courts of Appeal, sometimes when cases come up that involve similar issues under the same statute, let's say, these 11 Circuit Courts of Appeal might render different decisions. In other words, they interpret the same statute differently. So I'll give you an example. Um, in Louisiana, a case that arose in Louisiana, the case was called ONCAL, O-N-C-A-L-E, you don't really have to remember this one, versus Sundowner Offshore Services. I didn't talk about this, right? No, you did. Did I? Yes. Okay, <laughs> when I talked about the gay stuff. Yeah. Yeah, 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 okay. So, good, I'll have to go through that whole explanation. So, Again, what we had there was the Fifth Circuit saying to Mr. Oncal, you're accusing people of the same gender as you, you're accusing male co-workers of sexually harassing you. Well, you can't bring that kind of case because under the law, Title VII, that's only for women who are harassed by men. Men who are harassed by men or women harassed by women, we won't even let you in the courthouse. You don't have the right to even bring that lawsuit. That was the Fifth Circuit. But other circuit courts of appeal have heard similar cases and said, yeah, same sex sexual harassment is covered by Title VII. You can bring a same sex sexual harassment claim under this statute. Fifth Circuit says no. So there developed what's called a split in the circuits. Some of them saying same sex sexual harassment is not covered by Title VII. Other circuit courts of appeal saying, yeah, it is. Well, clearly somebody's got to be the ultimate decider. Somebody's got to break the tie, right? Because we live in the United States of America. Your rights, any citizen's rights under the laws <coughs> is not supposed to be dependent upon what state you live in, right? This is one country. This ain't 50 different countries, one country. So you're not supposed to have the benefit of the law in one, particularly federal law that's supposed to apply across the United States you can't be prejudiced, your rights can't be prejudiced because you happen to live in Louisiana, Mississippi, or Texas, but if you lived in California, you could bring your lawsuit, Mr. Oncal. So that's the kind of situation where the Supreme Court looks at it and goes, yeah, we need to take that case, because we need to decide who's right, the Fifth Circuit or the other circuits that are saying same-sex sexual harassment, you can sue on that under Title VII. So, where you have conflicts among opinions about the same law in the different circuit courts of appeal, eventually the U.S. Supreme Court is going to take the case and say, we're going to break the tie, we're going to decide which circuit is right. Um, in the Oncal case, they did exactly that, and they sided with Mr. Oncal and told the Fifth Circuit, once again, stop being so damn stupid and throwing people's lawsuits out. Like, we don't know where you got this idea from, but it, it reads wrong, right? The, the statute, the legislative history, it doesn't say anything about this statute only protects women suing men for sex harassment. It doesn't say anything like that. So you may not like these kind of suits, and maybe that's why you ruled the way you did Fifth Circuit, but don't do it again, because that's not the law. And that resolved that issue. Go ahead, Aaron.
prepared by the Supreme Court? Yes. Citing the language in Hinge? Is it, is, is that deemed the final or can it then go into the Excellent final? question. In rare instances, you might be able to go from here to here. But the majority of cases that go up through the state court system are matters of state law. So contracts law is a matter of state law. 